Okay, good evening ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start this show. It's a brand new event for us, it's a Q&A, Jim Church, you can take questions and answers with our special panel of guests. And in the middle, Simon Williams is going to do this for us. Simon, I'm going to say We'll see how it goes, hopefully some good questions. We'll start on the left. So we have Mr. Handsome over here, David Howell. Yeah. Grand Marshal yeah. David Howell, round of applause for David. So, from England, of course. And then we have the lovely Lizzie. Hello, Lizzie. So, move to Lizzie. And on the right, we have Shimmy from Mongolia. So, and last but not least, we have Emil. So, good stuff. Okay, so we're going to kick it off. I'm going to ask the first question. And then we're going to take questions from the crowd. So the first question is going to go to Shimmy. Sorry about that. But um, the first question is, if you weren't a professional chess player, what would you be? And I'll, I'll hand you the mic in case... Uh... Right. Um, is it working? Yeah. yeah. Well, since I was a kid... Oh. Since I was a kid, I really loved cooking. Like when I was five years old, I watched all these uh, cooking shows and tried to make my own food all the time. So I believe if I was into a professional chess player, I would be um, a professional chef, you know? I think I have a talent in that. Solid. Yeah. And I know a meal here. I've heard you sing a meal at this tournament. <laughs> would you be a singer if you were a chess player? No, I don't. Yeah. I'm trying to Right, we might need the mic again, so we get it over here. And now what we're going to do is a combination of serious and fun. So now we need a bit of a fun question, and, well, this guy's already smiling. So we're going we're to have to go to David. So, David, the Cletter is a very good hotel, lovely hotel, but in case the lift was not working, and you were stuck in the lift with a chess player, who would it be? Who would it be, David? I'll give you the, I'll give you the microphone just in case. Okay. Yeah. Can people hear me? Is this? Yeah. Is on? yeah okay. Um, oh, you threw me into the deep end, so I'm sorry, um, David. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you did warn me you might ask this question, but I still can't decide. I mean, if I were in a friendly mood, then we have Stuart Rubin here. <laughs> would, it, would it be Stuart? <laughs> sorry, Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> what, what about Brian, who owns a hotel? <laughs> so, Sorry, Brian. <laughs> it might be the other Stuart, actually. I mean, we got on so well. And he, can, he speaks four languages, he can teach me. You know, he could, uh, if I was feeling in a different mood, maybe, maybe a more romantic mood, then definitely not Stuart. But, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, there might be someone here, she knows who she is. But, yeah. Okay. okay. So, if you're, if you're non romantic, it'd be Stuart. And if you were romantic, it might be Stuart, but you're not really sure. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> uh, Lizzie, I'm going to have to ask you the same question then. Well, it depends. Lizzie, it's a lift, you're stuck in a lift, who's it going to be? Okay, um, if it is for entertaining, I would definitely go for nice or short. Okay, nice or short. Nice and short. So, so you'd be stuck in a lift with nice and short. Okay. Okay. How long would you be stuck in a lift with nice and short? I could be stuck forever. Forever? Okay, we need another question. This is too much. Okay. Now, another great thing, we, we have two lovely people in the audience who stand up. We have Tanya and Stuart, who are our roving reporters. So, um, Tanya and Stuart, do you have any questions? Tanya, do you have a question from the yes, crowd? Yes, so we have one from our online audience, and it is for all of you. Has any of you ever showed up to a game smashed? Well, I Simon, thought, maybe this is for you as well. I obviously can't answer these questions. Um, and Neil, I have to ask you this. No. Okay, good. Well, let's go around the table. So, okay, is it going to get worse this way? Let's see. Lizzie? I don't remember. Uh, great answer. Great answer. I love that answer. Okay. And David, last but not least. No, oh, we need to comment. I have to push you on this one. I have to push you. 
I actually play better when I'm home. I don't think so much, I don't worry about anything. Smashed never. Well, we are true professionals here, and of course we don't drink much, hence the water. So um, we'll take another question from our roaming reporters. So I think this time, let's go to Stuart. Stuart, do you have a good question? Okay, well, I'm not going to another question. Let's know who's the next one. Okay, this is probably one for you, Amy. I like if I uh, put you on the spot here. I'm not sure who submitted this question. Somebody online, I think. If you were FIDE president, <laughs> what, what's the first thing that you would do as FIDE president? First. You don't expect any serious answer. Well, you can say what you want to. Yeah. Well, we die. No, we need answers. We need answers. <laughs> But Emil, you have your own organisation, so right. what changes should we make, really? To improve chess in general, I think. Well, it's, it's getting too serious, but I think, in general, we need a better image for chess, and uh, we need some sort of clean air or all kinds of organisation in a positive way in the world, and not be actually linked to all sorts of uh, events which, which do not make chess Good, I would prefer to be a good old times by big quite controversial, but in Saudi Arabia we had the world amidst some rapid championships and Israeli players didn't play. Um, so what's your opinion on that again? It might be going on for the next two years as well, that's it. Well, it's pretty simple. Just by all the rules that are required by the state. And in the official championship in the country, which is not allowed to play in the country, it's very impressed by all But also, I would like to. Piece of Michael Bill, yeah, okay. I would like to mention that many players, except for Israeli players and Iranian players who had a problem in Qatari, uh, also we have to take a look at many players, about 40% of the top male players and some top women players refuse to go there although they could go there. And that's even more of a sign. I mean, here we can see the players who could go there, like Ikaru Nakamura or Muzichuk sisters, who would be guaranteed to win a huge prizes, they decline to go. So something is really bad about that and people should recognize it. But unfortunately the situation today is like it's ever repeating mantra. There is no other bid. You have to go there or no championship. The problem is that it's the very same people who create the situation that there are no other offers. There are no other bids. So it's quite simple. Why is the organizer like Rex Simfeld, who pours in millions of dollars every year, doesn't want to hold an official championship in, in, in the US? I think he would, but maybe not dealing with the present form. Very good answer. I mean, maybe maybe Brian could hold it here in Gibraltar. What do you reckon? A couple of years time, possibly Brian. I don't know where Brian is, but that brings me to the next question. And we're going to the left here. So um, chess has a reputation, uh, which is changing, I think, all the time. And we want to get it into the mainstream media, I think. So how can we make chess more accessible and also popular in mainstream media? Of course, it depends country to country. In England, generally, it does have a great reputation. So, David, if you're in charge of the media, in how would you do it? How would you make chess more popular in general? Another tough question, actually. Um, I mean, I think events like this. I mean, okay. I think we should be highlighting the personalities within chess, not just the game itself. I mean, there's a lot of focus on analysis of moves, long variations, which maybe don't appeal to the wider public. Um, I mean, if people could, people could meet us, see what we like. I mean, having question and answers like this. I mean, dinners, battle of the sexes, these kind of things. I think slowly things would move in the right direction and people would see that actually chess is for everyone. I mean, it's for all races, all genders, everything. And um, I mean, hopefully that will get the message across. Okay. But, yeah. Well, let's move slowly. that question I mean, around the table. So, over to you, Lizzie. How would you make it more popular? Ch oh, that's, a, that's not a good look. Okay, <laughs> we can move it around before you think if you want to. So, over to you, Lizzie. What do you reckon? How can we make it more popular to the mainstream? Well, I, I mean, I can only speak uh, 
for like Germany because I don't have so much experience. I just think like in general the advertisement about tournaments is in general not so professional in comparison to other sports. I mean I don't speak here for Gibraltar because it's fantastic here, but a lot of tournaments actually lack this kind of really huge advertisements that people get attracted to and I think this is already like the marketing is already like one thing which can be improved in general. Okay. Make it more professional. So, okay, over to you, Shimi, and obviously chess is massive for Mongolia. Right. So, uh, okay, so how can we make it more popular in general? I think we can actually divide it into two sections. It will be like an amateur chess and then a professional chess. Like in our country, we're actually uh, organizing every year the uh, amateur chess championship in Mongolia. So it's been organized successfully for the last five years. So the players are getting more and more and getting interested. And it's organized by the government of Mongolia. And the prime minister um, is actually sponsoring and funding it. So I think it's fundamental is important. So I mean, to promote more chess and in amateur level folks, and also in the chess, I mean, professional level together, like uh, the tournaments like Gibraltar and other tournaments. So I think uh, in Mongolia it's working quite well. So also like uh, FIDE and some other tournaments are organizing the amateur chess championship as well. I think it's uh, good for the chess. You know? And also I'd like to promote chess for the women, you know? Like, yeah, I mean, because... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when we, yeah, like uh, Brian is promoting a lot and doing good job for the women chess because uh, a lot of girls actually playing in uh, different countries, like in Mumbai and a lot of other But uh, the price amount and uh, the tournaments are compared to uh, men's chess is quite low. And it's like, for example, in our country, the price is two times lower than the men's. So I think we actually need to improve that as well. Right? Yeah. Well, I, I think one thing about Gibraltar is it's positive. Positive dis discrimination in favour of encouraging females to play here. And um, get your questions ready in the crowd because we're going to go to another question. I think we're going to Tanya. We also do have two boxes here hidden, and we've got a, a sensible box, sensible question, and we've got a, a kind of naughty box. But um, you can choose which box you take a question from. So, first of all, Shu or Tanya, do you have another question? This is for Liz and for Chimmy. I want to know if you had a woman FIDE president, what is the first thing that she would do? If you had a woman FIDE president, which, like yourself. what's the first thing you'd do? Like yourself. If you were FIDE president, what would you do? Honestly. Um, I would just equalize the system and then men and women, which means like also to install a candidate tournament. I mean, just to have absolutely the same system like in the men's tournaments. No, I mean like the, the candidates tournaments, which is, doesn't exist. Like when we have a world championship, a knockout system, like a KO system, and this is about lottery. Yellow cards, no heckling from the crowd, please. This is about lottery, and if they have the same system like uh, like the men do have with a candidates tournament, and then the winner is playing against uh, uh, that uh, the current world champion, I think this system is much more fair, and it's not about lottery like what we're having now, because the knockout system is so much also about luck, because in two games everything can happen, and we, we saw that it's not always like the table. Okay. okay, well let's ask the same question over here. So. I agree with Liz. <laughs> okay, short but sweet I think so. Okay, well great. Well we're going to ask now a question to each contestant, well contestant, I don't know if that's the right word, but each panel member and they have to come to the box and then we have a short break. So let's go with David. Okay, so David, I'm going to pass the questions over. Now David, you have a serious box and you have a fun box. What, what do we think David's going to go for? Knowing David, would he go serious or fun? This... What do you guys want me to choose? Always fun. Uh, fun. Or, always fun. Which one's the fun box? This is the fun one, David, so let's go for that. Sorry. Okay, so the question is, what was the funniest thing that ever happened to you during a chess game? Good <laughs> question. There you go, David. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, I don't... I don't know if anything funny's ever happened. <laughs> I mean, I thought it was pretty funny today seeing an unnamed person 
go to the bathroom and not wash my hands. Other than that, oh, okay. So that doesn't sound like one, David. I thought it was funny. Oh, fuck, come on. Uh, David, you can actually choose another fun question. So. Okay, David, what's another one? He wants another one. I want another one. I don't know, during chess I'm so focused, you know. Okay, professional. Okay. Oh wow, I'm pretty sure. Okay. okay, what's the worst thing that can happen to you before a chess game? Okay. <laughs> um, I did once, quite recently, get an upset stomach at a chess tournament, and it was not a pretty sight. So, so how, how did that, how did <laughs> that go? Details, sorry. Um, I, I didn't win the chess game, as you expect. Um, for it. I mean, yes, barely. Barely, okay. That's another it wasn't here tomorrow, so. it's fine guys, it's fine. So, Liz, okay. So we go around, just one question quickly. Lizzie, are you going to go serious or fun? Come on, you've got to go fun, we don't, you know, for now. Can you read this? I, I can try. <laughs> Stuart, how am I No, no, I'm only joking. <laughs> Right, can you say who is the hottest player quality times rating? Rating times hot. Uh, and so, this is basically, who is the most attractive player if you, take, if you take their rating and you take their, I guess, physical ability as well? Uh, it doesn't have to be in this tournament, but um, it can be. You've got someone over here. <laughs> I wanted this question. Um, I have to quickly go with the rating the smallest for... No, I think it's uh, Alexander Motilio. Okay, do we have Alexander in the house? Um, because he should be very happy now. <laughs> so, um, okay, nice answer. Okay, right, so we're moving around. So, I think this is the fun one, but I'm not sure. We'll randomise it, so... Uh, yeah. Oh, this this is serious. Time. Okay, this is fine. I like the way everyone's going for a fun question. You know, this is the way chess should be. Do you want me to read the, do you want me to read the question? Yeah, it's okay. Which world famous personality would you choose to advertise on a sport? So that was which world personality would you I think the same world would be a good personality for me. Is it for the chess or is it like overall? I think for chess. The chess. From chess, chess, yeah. Mm. I think, um, well, Magnus Persson is the best. Woo! Well, we all love Magnus here, don't we? So, yeah, he is. He's a great, he's a great ambassador for chess. So, okay, last. He is doing he does some modeling as well, right? Besides chess, I think. I, I think Magnus got voted the fourth most attractive Texas. guy. Sexy, sexiest guy in the world, you know. I know, was it? Well, okay, let's just see. Hands in the air if you think that's right. Does anyone think he's the fourth most attractive person in the world? <laughs> Loads of hands going up here. Great to see. <laughs> okay, good. And Emil, uh, this is serious, this is fun. And we'll take a break after the next question. I'll pass you the mic as well. Oh, that's a good question. Will a woman ever be a world champion? Oh. Well, that's, that's, that's a good question. And uh, in general, if we talk about men and women and what can be done, I actually tend to disagree partly with Nigel Short, who considers women being wired differently. It's, I think it's a number of uh, reasons why women do not play still do not play as good as men in general. Uh, it's one of the reasons might be some, some sort of physical or psychological reasons, but it's not only like, it's a simple reason. I would suggest it would be a great idea if some sponsor who is behind women's rights gonna advocate increasing enormously price funds for women. Enormously, not like here. He is very respectful. Like but not like the world, or 10 times like that. To have to have a women's world champion to earn as much as Magnus Carlsen earns today, to have uh, let's say ten times more than they earn today, and to see if there will be any impact in ten years' time. Because today, as we know, many women do not have the motivation to grow up from the certain level. 
let's say if a player today she is 2500 rated, she basically has to work a lot. I mean, to, to, to dedicate all herself to become 2580 or even 2600 without any significant financial change or status change or whatever. If, if there will be a change, and uh, the players who are about 2,500 will see that by reaching new heights, like 2,650 or 27, they will reach far, far different kind of uh, income, prestige, and everything. That would be a good call to, to see if it can change or not. Because if you see, if you compare women's sport and men's sport, everybody knows heroes of the women, women athletics or tennis, Sharapova or uh, whatever runners. Uh, but in chess, because women and men they play together, but they do not play for the same money, it actually reflecting the fact that women do not have from the certain point of motivation. They get to a certain point, they get more or less decent income, but nowhere close to the top men. It would be, if anything can change the situation when women are much, much lower at the top, it's the fact that the price funds could be increased dramatically, maybe for a short span to take, okay, Girls, we have 20 billion in chess for 10 years, and let's see how you manage to, to handle with that. And maybe that will serve as a trigger for many younger players, or for many future players that would never become a chess player to become and, and to, to, to work on chess seriously. And maybe it helps. And then we'll see if they like different uh... Okay. Yeah. I, I also I think we have to ask one of the ladies this question as well. So let's, let's go to Lizzie this time. And, um, or should we go? To, no, okay, let's go this way. So, what, what do you think? About the question? Yeah, same question. Really. Um, well, yeah, what Emma said is uh, I totally agree with it because, like, right away, actually, for me, like, for example, myself, I'm facing the same problem because, like, okay, I'm like 2400 now, but uh, financially and in different ways, I don't have the good support and so on. It's for me a bit difficult to play because I have a son. And not only myself, like all of our just players, they have two kids, three kids. And uh, we're basically playing for our passion for chess, you know. Like I love this sport for, and this sport for, and I've played for almost 25 years. So I don't want to just give up right now. That's why I keep playing and trying to make my norms and so on. But it would be really helpful if we have this financial support and like men, you know. So then we can actually motivate ourselves and dedicate ourselves fully. And yes, as Emil said, we have this emotional and like psychological uh, I mean, uh, problems maybe compared to men, but still, if we have such kind of support, I think uh, the woman just would make a lot of progress. You know? I think we've got Nigel here who wants to say something. Okay. Surprise, surprise. Just, uh, a comment which is a little bit different. Um, if you are a, a man, and let's say you're living in, in France or Spain or somewhere, and you're 2,500 and you're a professional chess player, you're almost starving. If you're a woman and you're 2,500, you are at least surviving. The, there is sexism there. It's in favor of the women. So, ac acknowledge the point. Okay. Well, I don't mean, well, I, I mean, well, we have to have an answer here from Emil. If yeah. I may, it's definitely like that, but take a look at tennis. You remember Navratilova played corners. He played a full court and she played only uh, three quarters of a court. Because obviously men are stronger, but it does not prevent, let's say, in Wimbledon or in US Open to have the same prizes or close to the same prizes. So did I understand correctly that you uh, acknowledge that um, men are better chess players than women? Of, of course. At, at, right. At the okay. This is men. the whole point. Yeah, yeah, that's that's, that's I mean. the <laughs> No, you, you don't need, you don't you need know. such a question or cause, but you can have a look on the rating list. The, cha the question was if something is possible to be done to, to change the situation. And my point being that if the prize funds in women's tournaments become not not maybe the same but much closer to, to men, it will serve as a trigger for many to, to 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 work much harder and to be much better. And uh, well it can help maybe it will not produce a women's world champion, real world champion, but it will 
surely produce much more stronger women players because they will have an incentive and motivation to, to improve and to, to, to work. Right, we've got another okay. audience question here. Uh, question I just want to uh, respond to the original question, which is can there be a woman world champion? Someday? That's a good one. <laughs> that, so, because people have been kind of talking around that question. Um, but I believe that's possible. I mean, Judith Poha has shown a woman can get to the top 10, she got to what, top 7? And um, that even even if there are some factors make, that make women generally poor chess players than men, you know, the, the, the one or two who deviate, um, who are the yeah, real outliers, they can exist in either of the sexes. And I think Judith Poha has shown that. So, okay, just going on that point a little bit more, so I'm going to go to you, Lizzy. So, do you think we can have a women's world champion? No. No. Um, I think we cannot have, because, I mean, I read some, some, some report about it. There was a huge report on the German magazine about it, why men actually are stronger than women in chess. And this was some kind of professor. And he actually stated it's not only about chess, there's nothing in the world where men are not superior, in no field, whatever you look at. And he's basing this on the fact that men have testosterone and women don't. And he's basing it just on this point, where men are superior in every single field in the world. I mean, even so, like so you're saying you think men are superior in every field? No, I mean, just, just for example, like, you know, um, what is very, very female, like Taylor, she would think like it's a woman thing, but even the best designers in the world are men. Like cooking, you think like it's a woman thing, but the best chefs in the world are men. But even in these fields like where you think that women actually like are usually more talented, but even in these fields like men are usually like at least from the top superior. Well, I'm glad you're saying that's not David, because uh, <laughs> we could be in trouble then. But I think we have to ask David this question. And uh, David, over to you. Oh, um, actually, I think, I mean, okay, I'm not as qualified as most people do talk about this, but I do feel we're approaching it completely wrong. I think it's all about participation numbers. I mean, I think we should be trying to catch this at a lower level, like at a younger age. I mean, if we, I mean, for example, something that I know about chess and school communities in London, I mean, it's nearly 50% girls playing up to the age of maybe 10, 11, and then they drop out later on. So I think they should be incentivized at a younger age, not at the 2500 level, not, 20, not later on. I mean, as well, but I mean, they should be caught. So, so how can we keep them, in, you know, them interested, you think, at that age? Well, this is the tricky part. I mean, <laughs> there, I guess at first there would have to be some um, extra support that possibly the boys wouldn't have, but it's tricky. I mean, they need the role models as well. They need girls on the scene at that level, helping them hands on. I mean, it's, okay, it's well, let's ask like, Shimmy the same question as well, I think. So, um, I think I answered, right? But I mean, that's exactly yeah. the question. All right, I think, uh, yes, uh, it would be really difficult for women to become the world champion, honestly, but uh, I think it's related to our nature of women and men, you know? That's what I think. And um, I also agree with you, so, unfortunately. Okay, it seems a bit negative, but um, hopefully it'll be a bit more positive in the second half. And I, I think we'll take a short break now, and we'll have a, a change of people on the panel. I know Emil has to shoot off you know, after a very long game, and uh, we'll be back in about five minutes, I guess. So, okay. We've got, two, we've got two new guests on the panel, which I'll let Simon introduce. Well, we've got the legendary Nigel Shorts. So a round of applause for Nigel, please. <laughs> and 
and we have Nino. So, hello, Nino. A round of applause for Nino as well, please. So, we're, we're going to kick off this second half with a, a chess question. Uh, I think we have to do a little bit of serious stuff. And I think occasionally. And um, this is going to be asked to every single person on the panel. Who was the greatest world champion ever? So, we're, okay, Nigel's already going for the mic, so I guess, Nigel, <laughs> keep it quick. Yeah, Emmanuel Lasker, 27 years world champion. Okay, Nigel, not that quick. Explain a little bit. Why, why, why Lasker? Why? Why? 27 years world champion. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it. Okay, short but sweet. <laughs> uh, Nino. Bobby Fischer, for me. Okay, why, why beautiful, Bobby? Beautiful style, very beautiful. And also, without computer, one of the youngest grandmaster. At 15, and nowadays it's only with computers that kids became so early grandmaster. Okay, great. So, okay, so we have, we have Laska and uh, Fisher. Um, I wonder if we're going to pair up with any of them. Okay, I'm going to have to guess your answers, but over to you, Lizzie. Someone's got to say Carlson, surely. Lizzie? No? Okay. Lizzie, who is it? Uh, for me, Michael Carlson. Oh, well, okay. I'm with you there. High five. <laughs> okay. Well, Macau's out. Why Macau's out? How romantic. How romantic. Uh, because, I mean, it, it sounds a bit strange not to say, but you, you really got balls, you know. When you... I like that. I like that. I mean, we know your opinion of balls at the moment. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay, and uh, last night, uh, over to you, Dave. Um, my world champion is Gary Kasparov. I grew up when he was reigning, and he defended his title so many times, and he was a great player. All world champions are pretty ahead of their time, but I felt he. Especially in this day of computer age, he's, he was very ahead of his time, so Eric is fine. Okay, well, some good answers there. I'm and quite. Okay, nice. Simon, one. Simon, are you going for Max Over? I'm. I, well, I'm, I, I can't believe no one mentioned Magnus Carlsen because uh, Magnus Carlsen's got the highest rating ever, and I'm surprised no one mentioned him. But uh, we're going to the next question. I think this will be a little less serious. Okay, so let's start again on the right, and we'll move around again. Um, why hasn't the hashtag Me Too campaign been addressed in the chess world? <laughs> I haven't even read this question. Who put that in there? We can blame our. Uh, okay, so Nigel. This is no problem. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded very weak. That, that was a very weak move there, Nigel. I want to hear. I want to hear it a bit louder. Back to Nigel. Come on. Come on, one more time. No. Oh. Sorry, but I think the right side you kind of skip it, sorry. <laughs> this is very timid. So, okay, so the Me Too campaign. Uh, Lizzie, have you experienced any Me Too campaigns in your life? Um, actually, it's the first time I actually hear about this. So. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess we don't actually need this because we have enough harass harassments in the chessboard. We, sorry, we have or we don't? We have enough comments, basically, though, that I don't think actually okay. we need it. What comments do you mean by we have enough? What, uh, as <laughs> in, uh, come on, let's hear, let's hear, do you online comments or uh, No, comments? I mean, I just know, like, when we're in a group of girls, we are talking, exchanging gossips and news and things, I mean, things. And Big things. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know if we want to know. And I bet that men in the group are doing just about the same. So. so it's a good good environment, basically, for your opinion. Well, I mean, I think it's like in every kind of close environment, like it's not like only in chess, I think it's in every sport where you have kind of discussions. And David, uh, let's finish with you. Yeah, I'm going to get serious. And actually, I wanted to, I mean, I was thinking about this question um, when we were talking about women and chess and why there were World champion. I mean, why well, we might not have a women's world champion, and especially with participation rates. And, I don't know. I, I did coach a couple of female players, and they said that they'd experienced this a lot. And they were, I mean, 18 so years old. And experienced what? They'd experienced comments, proposals, um, okay. very inappropriate things, and it put them off chess. They ended up going to university, right. never playing again. And so, how do we change that? We need to address this question, but I, mean, I, I don't know how to start or. I mean, well, well, at least here in Gibraltar, you know, it's, it's a pro discrimination, and we're, we're trying to encourage, sure, sure. encourage that to happen here. Okay, mm -hmm. bit serious there. Actually, in the end, that's supposed to, so it's supposed to be a fun question. So uh, I went a bit wrong. Okay, right. So we, we have um, Tanya and Stuart. So Tanya, do you have a question for yeah, the so crowd? Yeah, so you've got 
We've got one more question from our online audience. If you could go back in time, which chess player would you date? Oh, that's a good one. So, Nigel's getting the mic ready. <laughs> I never fear a man chick. <laughs> Sorry, say, say that again, Nigel. I, I thought you were going to say Lasker again. But, uh, you know, you know. Fear a man chick. She's always turned me on. <laughs> okay. Hang on, but you can't pass it around so quickly, Nigel. So, okay, Nino. Um, this is a tough. Okay. Someone speechless, you know. After Nigel's also. Oh, Nigel, you have to embellish a little bit. I, actually, um, um, I'm allowed to confess something because I'm a little bit drunk. Um, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with Vera. Yeah, because uh, I have my friend Carl Portman, who's written. Very good on chess in prisons. He's, he's done. Um, Does he make and, many girlfriends in prison? Chess behind bars. He's done that. I wrote the forward to to this book. But we had this idea that we could introduce a line of uh, Vera Menchik blow up dogs. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I don't know if we should move. I think we should move on at this moment. Would anyone hands in the air if anyone would buy those dogs? It's Nigel's new business idea. Not many hands. Okay, Nino, over to you. Yeah, okay, Tao. Tao. Yeah. Okay. What? Well, what? Come on, we have to. We have to give a reason. Just one reason. So why? Why Tao? Oh, okay. Such an interesting player, no? And also, he was good at about writing books, and uh, he had finished journalism, I think. So it's it's. A, I think I could have a nice talk also. <laughs> so interesting characters. He has a good character. Yeah, he was funny, exactly. Was like very funny and writing guy. this book with Namsky, he was a journalist, but by himself he was in journalism, and I think he was good narrator and a very funny person. Brilliant. Okay, so we're going around. I hope this is going to get a bit more uh, a bit more out there now. So Lizzie, is it going to be Tao again? Well, that would be the easy answer, right? We can't go easy. We've got to go. We've got to go a bit bizarre now. Well, I mean. Actually, I already gave this answer. <laughs> He's not a world champion. It has to be a world champion. Uh, you, you know, we need a world champion, Lizzie. So it has to be a world champion. Um, well, then it's Tao. Tao's a very popular guy. But actually, he was quite handsome as well. I mean, like, when he, he was... He had some good. amazing eyes. Yes, I don't know. I mean, I mean, my, my father played him, actually, and uh, he lost, like, in a very, very cruel way. But, I mean, I never met him because he died, like, so around the time when I was born, more or less. He was the unhealthiest person I've ever met That's in my entire was life. That's so why interesting, actually. I mean, <laughs> uh, I played him seven times uh, in, in total, but uh, I have... Wait, did you ever want to marry him, Nigel? I didn't want to marry him. You ever date? Date. I didn't date him either, no. Um, but uh, I have this uh, sort of a, a horror image in my mind uh, from the Subotica in Zonal in 1987. And uh, I saw him when um, actually he was being physically carried by Bagirov at that time. And he had a problem with circulation in his leg. And he had his trousers rolled up. And I, I, I swear his leg was completely blue. It was actually just one of the most disturbing things uh, I've ever seen because I, I held him in enormous uh, respect and admiration as a, a, a player and, and to see him in, in such pain and discomfort like that, it was uh, actually deeply distressing. Well, I, I think in a commentary I've been doing here with Yvanka, Yvanka mentioned that uh, Genius, and I think Tao can be called a genius, is that fine line between madness and going over the point. But uh, he wasn't mad at all. No. I mean, he was, uh, he maybe. was, he was uh, not in the, the least, he was highly intelligent. And what I recall about him was um, his humor. He was actually just a very funny man. And um, uh, and he could even make jokes in a foreign language when he was completely drunk. And uh, very, very um, good skill. You know, and that's that's something. It's it's not everybody who can no. uh, do do that. So um, you know, I think he's 
Probably, probably I speak for most of the people in this, this room, maybe just someone who I think has uh, contributed so much yeah, to, to the game of chess. And uh, it's been a great honor just to have had at least that little experience. Of, well, of, let, let's of let's get David's opinion as well, I mean, because uh, if you were going to pick, uh, you know, you have to do an original question first, David. So, a woman as well, champion. Uh, well, I'm a bit gutted because I wanted to say Tal. You know, if you I can still one. say Tal. It, it sounds like <laughs> Tal is the male. We need to have a Tal calendar going on here. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's so I'm well apparently. Season, yeah. So, um, if I had to choose a uh, women's world champion, then me. Oh, okay. Not women's world champion, but I mean, if I had to choose a women player, then uh, Juliet Polgar, partly because she can teach me a lot about chess, but also because our, our babies would be very high rated. Ah, oh, I like it. So if you did have babies, you want them to, you want them to be chess stars? Of course. Okay, why not? You know, they, they could bring in the money for you. And uh, red hair. And, and, okay, right, well, I think, okay, now we'll take one more question, possibly, from the audience. So um, I think uh, we have Tanya. And, and Stuart Conquest, who have one ready, and then we'll go to the box again. And if anyone's got a good question here, get it prepared. So the last one was a good one. Over to you, Tanya. So this is for all the panel members again. Um, who would be the toughest opponent for against Magnus Carlsen in the 2018 World Championships? Okay, well, let's go left to start with. So, Nigel, uh, the toughest <laughs> opponent, David, sorry, David, the toughest <laughs> opponent. <laughs> I, it's really worrying when I look at David I call him Nigel. I mean, uh, sorry to both of you. Uh, we were even wearing the same sweater yesterday. So. Very worrying. <laughs> so, okay, so, so David, who do you think is going to be the toughest challenger to Magnus Carlsen coming up? Um, I'm only saying this because he's here, or at least in Gibraltar. Um, Lev Aronian, I mean, I've seen so many times, I mean, so many games with Lev out playing Magnus. I mean, they have their uh, very interesting battles every time. I think Magnus maybe has a slight plus score now, but I've seen them, you know, work with him a couple of times. So I'd love to see that match. I'm not sure about them. I mean, Fabiano possibly as well, but I think Lev. Uh, okay, so, so we've got one Lev, one up for Lev, Lizzie. So you can't say Tau anymore, by the way. No. <laughs> No, I, I, I totally agree. I would also go for Levon Aronian because I mean he had a fantastic year in 2017. He's in great shape, and as I mean as, as David said, I think his score against Carlsen is like more or less about even. So plus, I mean he's not super aggressive, which means like he also has a quite has a quite solid style. So it's much tougher like for someone uh, like Carlsen like to to beat such a guy who is so solid actually. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it was a bit of a struggle, the last World Championships, but uh, you got there. And Nino, who, who do you think would be the biggest challenge? Well, about this question, let me be a bit nationalist and French chauvinist. <laughs> I would say Maxime Michel Lagrave, <laughs> because I'm French, so... Unfortunately, he's not in the, he's not in the cabinet. Yeah, but okay, he was in 2018, you mean, so, okay, okay. But, but I thought it was a general question for next... Nina, can I ask you another question? Okay. Um, the wild card went to Vladimir Kravik, and yes. he got the wild card, and he's, he's been there before. And a lot of people were debating whether this was a bit unfair. I mean, MVL, Maxime, maybe, I think, stood a chance. I mean, maybe he should have got the chance to get in the candidates. I mean, do you think he deserved that chance to get in the candidates? Rather yeah. than Vladimir sure. Kravik? Yeah. No, it's a tough question, but still, okay, he's such promising players that. Uh, of course, I would be happy to see uh, he disputing one day title. Okay, and Nigel. Yeah, I, I would also go for Levon Aronian. Um, I think he has a style which is not so well suited to events like this in, in Gibraltar, um, because um, in particular with the black pieces, he's very very solid. And a tournament like Gibraltar, you need a, um, a repertoire like Hikaru. Hikaru is just absolutely fantastic in this tournament. He's shown his great skills uh, year after year. Um, he's a very enterprising player. Quite frankly, I, th I would say he would uh, have no chances against Magnus. He has a terrible score. And I don't see that uh, cha changing. But, but Levon, on the other hand, this sort of 
very solid style with black and uh, an enterprising, um, imaginative style with white. I think it's very well suited for match play. And uh, you win matches with 51%. You, you don't need to, to, to score very, very highly. So Okay, so we've got a, a massive Lev vote there. Where is Lev? He's probably very excited about that. I, I think this might be a plus one if Lev's in the room somewhere. Um, but let's now go to the box. The box of doom. And there's only actually two weird questions left. So where we, I think, Nigel, you have to take a funny question. It's got, okay, you've only got two, so 50-50, Nigel. You pick one and I'll read it out for you, Nigel. So, okay. Well, do, you, do you want to read it out yourself, Nigel? So, get the mic. I'm sure your eyes Okay, so. <laughs> It was actually the same question before, so we, we move on. You have to have this one. Let's say, okay, so let's have a look. So maybe this is a bit more of a serious question, but um, how do you cope when you get struck? How do you progress in chess? What's the best way to progress? Is it any, you know, maybe it's yourself as a grandmaster, but also as an amateur? A very typical question. So you can answer it as a grandmaster to get approved, but also let's say as a 2000. Any advice, good advice for a 2000? Um, well, uh, Gary Kasparov, uh, I mean, he's had some various ghosted books, um, but in his books he said some, nevertheless, said some interesting things. And uh, I think the uh, capacity to work hard on your game. That is a talent. Um, that's where you're missing out on Simon. You know, the, well, the, I, the, I, 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 I work hard to sit here listening to this sometimes, but you know, what can we but do? That, that is part of, of talent. Talent is not something you're necessarily born so you, with. So you think the work you, ethic is very important? Work ethic is, is uh, very important. And um, one thing, uh, just a small piece of advice, actually from my own career, um, uh, it's a simple piece of advice, uh, I, I think many of you will know this, uh, analyze your own games. Uh, I, I do that basically all the time now. I didn't used to do it. It's actually much, much easier uh, in this day and age, because you you play your game, you go back to your room, and uh, you only need half an hour to put it on the and computer, put it on the computer and um, enter the game and and see what the engine is suggesting okay. to you. And you know, I mean, sometimes you're going to have games which are more complicated, which are worth uh, investing more time. Oh, so let's, so let's, self self analysis is is very, is, is very important. And uh, well, let's, let's, second let's second to this as well. Let, let's we'll, get... we'll we'll go over. I'll just give you an, an, yeah. another bit of advice. Um, if you can, um, uh, a lot of the really important tournaments uh, in the world, uh, including this one, are online these days. Have a look at some of the games, and a lot of them are actually very interesting. So just, you know, that's not even work, that's just what, okay. I, what I would consider okay. to be pleasure. Okay, well let's, let's go to this, so very condensed answer. Let's go to, okay, so how do you recommend to improve the game quickly? So, well not quickly, but how would you, what's your biggest tip to improve your game of chess? I mean, I remember how I got very quickly in Germany in the women's uh, section or in the girls' section superior over all the other girls. And actually the only difference what I did in comparison to them was like I played a lot of men tournaments, a lot of open tournaments and I was always like trying to, to play like really like good tournaments and uh, this was and I, I skipped all the youth events like I never played German youth championships and wasted my time with them. I played like two or three world championships but Usually, like these kind of tournaments, it's rather a waste of time. It's much better to play strong opponents. So this this would be an ideal tournament to play to to everyone. It's like a stepping stone. Of course, I mean this this or like Isle of Man or like Qatar. I mean Dutch tournaments actually they can make you like.
strong in a way because you really have to face tough opponents. And I like when you play like strong strong players, you understand that uh, this is not like what you're used to to play when you play like in some women's competition like in Germany or something. And you can say it's like a right rights of passage playing in some of these tournaments which have brought the game for 16 years. You have the Isle of Man, you have these big opens. Playing against the best players is the way to go. I mean, I think in German language there's such a phrase you learn the most from lost games actually and there's some truth about it actually. Right, we need something a bit more like I now. Okay, so David, I'm not even going to ask you that question because David, we need something a little bit more spicy for you. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna vet the question now. So, um, okay, we're gonna find a good one. Right. <laughs> that one, that one, should not have got in here. <laughs> so, okay. Um, right, let's go for, okay. We're gonna go random now. We're gonna go random, David. So, you ready? Get rid of that one, it's too long. On, David, man. I'm finding a good one. Which celebrity, not a chess player, okay? okay. So you, you can't take Nigel on this. But well, he's a bit of a celebrity on Nigel. But he can't be. He can't be a chess player. So which celebrity, not a chess player, would you most like to have dinner with? Wow. Um. And it can't be a chess player, David. <laughs> okay. Um, again, it would depend on my mood. Either Brad Pitt, if I wanted some, you know, life advice. So. Gym routines and that kind of thing. Um, or Neve Campbell. <laughs> Neve Campbell? Really that, that's person. a surprise. <laughs> I, mean, I, I fell in love with her when I was about 12 years old and I watched this movie. And, yeah, okay. yeah I, I mean, I'd like to say I've grown past that. But, yeah. Okay, so we're going Brad or, or, or Neve? Or Neve. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll go to Nino. So, Nino, which celebrity? Um, that must be alive as a person or does it matter? It doesn't have to be alive, I don't think. Oh, probably to do some writer, I don't know, like dead, Oscar Wilde or Jack London or something like that. <laughs> well, um, so yeah. let's go alive, let's go alive. Ah, so let's go alive. alive. We'll make it a bit more, yeah. Well, I'm going to go alive now, so uh, it has to be alive. That's a good question, because I was just a bit sick, you know, I would never thought, like, to suddenly to appear in the dinner, but, uh, well... Maybe a drink, drink in the pub. So, <laughs> who would you like to go for a drink with? There was still juice, but he's dead too, so... <laughs> Well, somebody who changed the world, you know? I want somebody who impacted, like, to make something important, so... Uh, somebody, like... Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, Nigel, would okay. you... Would Maybe you... I go to Nigel and I will think... And... So, Nigel, would you pick Jesus? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> That's a very simple answer, and uh, I, I think we know why. So... Um, <laughs> Good answer, but okay. Um, so, Liz, you have to answer that. Um, I take Mickey Rourke from 1986. <laughs> so, the old Mickey. No, actually, in 1986, he played in this movie Nine and a Half Weeks, and this is. I've seen the movie. This is basically this is the Mickey Rourke I want to. to uh, okay. Did, did you? Ever, does that help you prepare, like, you know, sort of watching such movies, <laughs> or is it just chess face? Uh, it's just. Okay, right, let's move on oh, to... Geez, sorry, I, 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 I think we'll take at least one more Simon, question. Can I just interrupt on that? I just wanted to say um, that actually I saw this mo movie Nine and a Half Weeks in Germany with German... Uh, it was dubbed in German, so I didn't really understand too much about it. But maybe that didn't matter. I don't know. <laughs> it's probably not the storyline. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it's yeah, probably it was, something else Liz was thinking about, yeah. I guess. But anyway, we that's have what to, my Bundes, let, Bundesliga days for Zerling. Let, let's, let's bring our lovely Tanya or Stuart in and let's get a question from Tanya. And what's the question, Tanya? Okay, so which song would describe your life? What's the anthem to your life? Oh, that's a tricky one. I know this is the end is quite appropriate for thoughts, but uh, you know, we're getting there. <laughs> so no, I'm only joking. Okay, so let's go, who's got an answer? Okay, Nigel. Sorry about the way you get these questions, <laughs> yeah, That's a really <laughs> tough question. <laughs> There's somebody in here, you know? Okay, Nigel, well, maybe Nigel. Nigel I'm sure Nigel has one song that he really wants to tell us, Nigel. <laughs> that describes my life? Yeah. yeah. Beastie Boys, fight for your right to party. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> okay, let's go over to David. Sorry, David, I'm throwing you in there. 
<laughs> I'm drawing a blank. Um, <laughs> Is that a song? I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. Definitely something by the Spice Girls. <laughs> okay. Um, can you sing a little verse from that, possibly? Yeah. Like Maybe one. on the last one. When one. two becomes one or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> okay. um, I'll have a little think, yeah. I mean, okay. I think this is an idea for next year, though, karaoke. This yeah. is what karaoke is a great Just idea. Karaoke. Okay, who would, you, who would you pick as the main karaoke candidate? I would want to do a duet with Liz. Oh, we can see this. We could try it out if you want. <laughs> should, we, should we do it? Liz, okay, so what about yourself? What song describes your life? And you did say earlier, and I didn't ask you this question, and I, I should ask you now. If you, if you weren't a chess player, so obviously you've been a professional chess player a long time, I thought it was a very interesting answer. Uh, what would you do as a career, possibly? Okay, I mean, when I was 16, actually, I asked my mom to get me to music school, and she told me, like, it's not a good idea because she tried the same, and her genetics were not good for this, and I mean, in terms of opera singing. But uh, that's why she told me, like, it's no point because my lungs are not wide enough because of her genetics, and I never tried, and actually, eventually, I think she was wrong. But uh, actually, I'm happy that I became a chess player. Good stuff. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking you might pick an uh, operatic song. Um, nah. No. Okay. What, what would be your song then? Super difficult question, actually. Very was, difficult. Um, Far from any road. So which one? Far from any road. Okay. Like Handsome it. family. Okay. I, 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 just, I just don't know the song. No, no. Can you sing it for one second? Nah. No. Okay. Right. Nino, do you have an answer? Okay. Next question. Let, let's go. We have one more question yeah. from. Uh, from our audience that for all the panelists here do you think that playoffs are the best form of tie breaks? Okay, so um, playoffs in what I know kind of originated here at this Open and it seems to be adopted around the world as an exciting form of finding a winner because normally you split it, they did it recently at Tata Steel and well, personally, I'm going to say I think it's a great thing having the playoff as that extra level. But let's get everyone's views, and let's start with Nina. So, um, okay, let's go, David. Let's go, David. Sure. Um, I think yeah. playoffs are a great thing. I think it's the fairest way. It's the best of a bad bunch. I mean, I, I mean, tie breaks, mathematical things. They're also random, and often they do go to. I mean, yeah. playoffs, playoffs for sure. It's more fun for the fans as well. I, I think if we're going to popularise chess and make it accessible to not just chess players, we need to make it exciting as we can. So, uh, do you agree, Nigel, with that one? Uh, I agree that um, playoffs are the fairest way of deciding uh, an event. Of course, uh, they certainly didn't originate here. I mean, they've been going for um, decades. Uh, not centuries longer than that. So um, uh, the idea of um, uh, having a playoff is is a very old one. Um, but um, th there are certain systems. The you have Sonnenborn Burger and, and so on. It, it's um, it, it's a, a spurious scientific me method. Um, and uh, I think um, it's probably more scientific to spin a roulette wheel than uh, these things, uh, okay. to, to, to be honest. So, um, you know, I, I've been on, I've benefited from random tie breaks and I've suffered from random tie breaks over, over the years. So I've had my ups and downs uh, and it, it, it's actually incredibly annoying when uh, you're on the wrong side of, of these uh, things. Uh, just a small example, last... Let's make it small, Nigel. Yeah, let's do that, yeah. <laughs> last year in, in Elsinore, in um, Denmark, um, I was in a time for what was it, second place. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I had, for example, uh, I had the same ELO rating, more or less, as uh, Sasha Kieran, and uh, he was losing rating points on this event, I was gaining rating points, and yet he made three times as much money as I did on, on this, because he had a higher high tie rate. 
And uh, look, I'm not saying I, I, I've never benefited. I have benefited from completely random tie breaks. Uh, playing, uh, you know, you lose a game over the board, uh, you've got nothing to complain about at the end of the day. Okay. That, that's really okay. how it should be. Okay. okay, so let's go to Nina, yeah. No, okay, um, I'm for playoffs, of course, because still it's uh, more fair as a system than just, you know, usual conditions, which is quite sometimes messy. Okay, I'll play it also. Playoffs, so basically, first time uh, national championship in France, I won by playoff. <laughs> but the question is, um, how well it's done, because sometimes playoffs are right after the round, depending on organization, because, okay, people cannot play, uh, stay there forever, right? And uh, play, the players are tired sometimes, and also the, in France we had this uh, problem that uh, there were like 20 minutes playoff, but if you draw them directly like three minute bleeds or something like that, it was really short, I mean. And then if you decide to fight us on such kind of thing, it's still quite unclear, right? so, because you play a tournament in a classic cadence, right? And then you suddenly go to a blitzing almost. So I mean, I don't think it's totally just, but it's still better, I think, than just simple conditions. Okay, well, well great. Look, um, I think we have Stuart with... Can I ask a question? Yes. Please. We, we can. I don't know how much time, I think we should wrap up very soon. Maybe sure, it should be the last sure. one, yeah. unless someone from our audience is... Better be a good question, Stuart. Yeah, can I just ask this one first, and then maybe a young man here would ask his question to finish with? I just something I put up. I mean, I think we all know chess players have world travel. Nigel's travelled to about 100 plus countries, I think, I don't know how many. And um, all of our panelists have travelled a lot. I was going to ask, this is really my question, if briefly you could just tell us, each of you, a favourite or one of your favourite countries or cities where you play chess. Um, I'd like to hear that. So just quickly around the table, maybe. Okay, let's keep it quick. And uh, Nigel. Cape Town. Uh, I mean, when they had water. <laughs> Cape Town when they had water. Okay. Well, I like sunny countries and home, so I'm open in Italy or Spain, but I like Korea when it's really well organized tournaments, like Gibraltar is really yes. great, because it's awesome with both organization and there are really few tournaments like this, so thank you to you. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go to this. Um, actually, for me, it's not about country, it's for me always about company. So, if, if I would choose a tournament or somewhere to play, I would probably always like to play with my team of Mulus. Mulus a French team, class. yes, because okay. with them, wherever we, we go, wherever we are, it's like just always great. I think I think that's great. I mean, you know, I'm getting a bit old now, but my friends and life, as you know, in chess, it brings community. It brings my whole life is around chess, and my friends have been chess, and all of my friends, so brings people closer. And David, where would you go? Um, I had a fantastic time in St. Louis last year. I love how they promote chess. I mean, they're just, everyone was so passionate about it. But I would have to say Gibraltar. I think it's my 12th time here. And I think all my favorite people are pretty much in this room. So Gibraltar, for sure. I think that's, that's a great answer. That's a great answer. I think that's probably, probably, OK. We have to have one, one more question. question. Now, let's go for it. Yeah. <laughs> Chess, what chess piece describes your personnel? Oh, that's a great question. So we had a question. I love that. That's a great way to finish. What's your name, sir? Christopher Yu. Christopher Yu. So we have a question from Christopher Yu. Christopher's a very strong chess player. He beat me at Blitz in the Isle of Man. And he beat well. David at Blitz. So Christopher Yu has probably come up with a question of the night. So which chess piece best describes your personality? And I think we're going left to right, so look this way, yeah. I would say the knight, because I'm a tricky old guy. I, oh, I love it, I love it, good answer David. Um, I think uh, it's a pawn because it's the most flexible. I mean, it has so many different functions, it goes straight, it um, exchanges in a diagonal, then it promotes in anything, and it's quite chaotic, and that's probably just me. And it can become a queen. Well, if it needs to, yeah. Yeah, or, or a knight. <laughs> so, okay, Nina. Okay, maybe also some kind of promoted power in something, I don't know in what. <laughs> okay. So a pawn that's about to promote. But at least, yeah, I started with a pawn for sure. Okay. A bishop, because I like dressing up in ecclesiastical vestments. <laughs> Well, definitely a good night to end the show. Um, and, well, I mean, I must sort of uh, wrap it up now. And this is the first time we tried this. Um, 
So we're going to learn, we're going to improve. It's an idea of Brian's who, who's made this festival kind of possible, along with many other people, you know, too many to mention here. So hopefully it's gone all right. We're going to improve and make better advancements next year. It's been a load of fun, and we've got to thank, first of all, round of applause to all our panel here. So. And also to our people on the floor. So we have Stuart and Tanya. Big round of applause for them. <laughs> to the audience, you might as well clap yourselves because you'll be a bit boring around you, so I'm not giving you a clap. <laughs> and to Susie and friends and everyone else, and of course Brian. So thank you very much. And thank you very much. Well, you don't have to do that, but <laughs> thank you, Stuart. So it's been a lot of fun. So thank great. So time to go to the bar. <laughs> <laughs>